always consider it a great honor and privilege to be here among the saints on this first day of the week to worship. It's good to have another opportunity to stand before you and present another portion of God's holy and divine word. And we hope and trust the things that we're going to say here this morning are going to be right beside of God, edifying, uplifting, encouraging unto you. We're going to continue our study from the seven churches of Asia. This morning we're going to read from Revelation 2, beginning in verse 12. We're going to look at the letter to the church at Pergamos. Revelation 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 12 and read down through verse 17. This is Jesus speaking, John the Apostle dictating, writing, and he says there in Revelation 2 and verse 12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword in two, with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So has also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. We talked a little while this morning about the letter that Jesus writes to the church at Pergamos. Before we do, though, we have a tremendous privilege to approach our Father in heaven and more prayer session. Father, we thank you for your word and your truth. As we've noticed the last few weeks, the, this is the third congregation that the Apostle, the, the apostle John uh, pins a letter to from Jesus Christ. We noticed a few weeks ago, Revelation 1 and verse 11 and 19 through 20, that Jesus appears to John and he instructs him to write what he sees and to send to the seven churches that are in Asia. So as a result, we have the book of Revelation. Chapters 2 and 3 are specifically written the individuals, individual congregations in the area of Asia Minor or modern day <coughs> Turkey. The first church that is addressed is the church at Ephesus that we noticed a few weeks ago. And Jesus command, commends them for their labor, for their doctrinal purity. He has a lot of good things to say to Ephesus. But he says there's one thing that you're lacking and that is that you have left your first love. They lost their passion. They lost their zeal in Christ. So they were doing a lot of things right. But they were lacking that, that passion that they had when they initially obeyed the gospel. And so, Jesus instructs them, like he does almost every church that he writes to, to repent, to overcome these issues that they're having. The second congregation, to receive a letter from the Lord, is the church at Smyrna, that we noticed a couple weeks ago. When Jesus doesn't chastise this congregation at all, because they were in the midst of a terrible persecution. They were being persecuted Terribly, And then Jesus says, he recognized the fact that, that physically they were poor, they were in poverty, but he said, spiritually, you're rich. You don't have a lot of material goods, but you are rich. And he encouraged them to be faithful unto death. He also told them that more persecution was coming, that they're going to be uh, tried of the devil. Ten days, he says there, and I don't know exactly what that means, uh, but I know that that meant that their persecution wasn't going to end. And he didn't promise that that would end, but he did tell them, in verse 10 of Revelation 2, that if you are faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. And that's the same message for you. That's the same message for me. Jesus doesn't promise to end all of our suffering. God don't promise to end all of our suffering, even if we're suffering for his name. Even if we're being persecuted for him, he doesn't say it's just all going to go away. He doesn't promise to end it. Never promised that. But he did promise that if we endure, that if we overcome, that if we're faithful unto the point of death and to do our death, that he'll give us a crown of life. And that's the same message, that's the same guarantee 
than is for every Christian today. It was to those at Smyrna. And this is rich and been preserved down through history by the hand of God so that you and I would also be encouraged. The third congregation, again, Jesus addresses is the church at Pergamos in these verses. And this is the only time in the entire Bible this group of Christians are mentioned, kind of like Smyrna. Smyrna's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Well, we don't know anything about this congregation. You know, we don't read in the book of Acts about Paul going to Pergamos and establishing a congregation there. Maybe he did at some point. Maybe Titus did. Maybe Timothy did. Maybe uh, one of the other believers in Christ. Obviously, somebody went there and established a congregation, but we don't know how it was started. We don't know its beginnings. But obviously, there was a group of Christians in this city. And it was a city that was north of Smyrna and Ephesus, again, in Asia Minor, in modern-day Turkey. And this is the northernmost church of the seven that John dictates a letter from the Lord to. This city, Pergamos, or is sometimes called Pergamum, it was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. And this city had temples there dedicated to many Greek and Roman gods, such as Zeus and Athena. You've probably heard about them if you're like me when you was in school. We had you talk sometimes about Greek mythology and, and Roman mythology. And Zeus, of course, was the was the supreme god of the Greeks. They had a lot of gods. Athena was one of them as well. But he was the main one. He was the one that lived up on Mount Olympus, according to their tradition. And uh, he was their main god. Well, they had a temple in Pergamos to Zeus. And this city, just like Smyrna, had a culture of emperor worship. Not only did they recognize all these Roman gods, but they also recognized the Caesars, the Roman emperor, as God himself. And the citizens were expected to worship him. And this is probably why Jesus referred to this city in verse 13 as where Satan's seat is. Reference to its importance in the Roman Empire. No doubt this was a very wicked and evil city to earn the designation of Satan's throne. Think about that description. This city was called Satan's throne. How bad did it have to be to be described by that as that by Jesus? Jesus begins here by describing himself as he does in every other passage. And he says, he who has the sharp two-edged sword, Revelation 2 and 12. John describes Jesus in Revelation 1 and 16 as having a sharp two-edged sword going out of his mouth. Of course, this language is figurative and it's symbolic of the powerful word of God. You know, the word of God is described as the sword of of the Spirit. You remember Jesus himself by John, in John the first chapter, is described as the Word of God. So what do we see here? We see that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. We see Jesus Christ is the Word of God made flesh, John 1, and so it's natural that Jesus would be associated with this sharp two-edged sword, Revelation 2 and 12. The Hebrew writer describes it this way in Hebrews 4 and 12, a very familiar passage I think to all of us. The Bible says there, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the vision of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and as the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I wait for Pepe to quote that. You know, Pepe quotes a lot of times verses uh, whenever we're standing up here. He used to quote that a lot. I remember him quoting that scripture a lot up here about the power of the word of God. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it will discern the thoughts and intents of mankind. That's what Jesus Christ is. He is the Word made flesh. The message, the Word that Christ delivers to the Christians at Pergamos and the other congregations of us today, it's powerful, isn't it? It's powerful. And a two-edged sword, so we must take heed to what is being said. As Jesus did with the letter to the Ephesians, he begins by praising this congregation for those things that are done right. He begins commending them, congratulating them, if you will, on the things that they're doing right. The Lord salutes them in verse 13. Let's read it. It says there, Jesus says, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. Well, this tells us a lot about their condition, doesn't it? This tells us that just like those in Smyrna, they were being persecuted. 
And you know, we don't know anything about that. We can't relate to that in any really in any real sense of the word because we don't know what it's like to be persecuted for our faith. But yeah, there may be times whenever people ridicule us. There may be times when people mock us and make fun of us. But that's nothing compared to what these early Christians had to deal with. And so Jesus commends them for what? For holding fast His name. Holding <coughs> fast His name. Do we understand what that means to hold fast the name of Christ? Do we understand the power in the name of Christ? The saints at Pergamos had confessed the name of Christ as all Christians must do. You know what Jesus said to do in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33? He said, if we deny him before men, he will deny us before his Father in heaven. But if we confess his name before men, he will confess us before his Father in heaven. You know, when we talk about confession being part of the plan of salvation, sometimes I think people misunderstand. And they think that, that when we say you've got to confess to be saved, they think that we mean you've got to confess your sins. But when the Bible talks about confession, it's not talking about confessing your sins. For an alien sinner, the confession that must be made is the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what Jesus said in Romans 10 and 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What confession? Well, look at Romans 10 and 9. The confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession that carries with it the power of salvation. Do you remember there in Acts the 8th chapter when the eunuch had been approached by, by the evangelist Philip? He was on that road headed back home in that desert place. And he was reading Old Testament Scripture, Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go and join himself in that chari chariot. And he says, you understand what you read? And he did. He was reading from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, a prophecy about Jesus. But he didn't understand what he was reading. And he said, who is the writer speaking of, himself or some of the man? You remember in that chapter is the great prophecy of Jesus that talks about how the, like a lamb was done before a shear. So, so Jesus was led. He opened not his mouth. He was bruised for our transgression. For our iniquity, the, the sin of the world was upon him. Chastisement of us all was upon him, that scripture says. So he's reading this, and he doesn't know who that's talking about. So the Bible says that the preacher Philip began that same scripture <coughs> and preached unto him Jesus. Preached unto him the gospel. Preached unto him the precious name by which we're all saved. And the Bible says that they came to a certain water. And... The, the eunuch said, see, here's water. Now, they're in the desert. I don't know what kind of water it was. It might have been some little oasis where there was a spring. I don't know. It might have been a trough for watering camels. I don't know what it was. But the Bible says it came to a certain water. And he says, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? In other words, why can't I be baptized? Of course, baptism into the equation. Well, the Bible says he preached Jesus on the night. You can't preach Jesus without preaching baptism. <laughs> so he came and said, why can't I be baptized? And the preacher said, you can. If you believe. That's a prerequisite of baptism, isn't it? What did Jesus say? Jesus said, Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized is saved. That's the equation. He that believeth and is baptized is saved. Well, that's what Philip said to the unit. If you believe you've got faith, you can. Why? Because that faith and trust and confidence in the Lord leads us to salvation. That doesn't mean we're saved at the moment of faith. The Bible teaches that faith that works is dead. Faith alone never saved anybody. Didn't save King Agrippa in Acts 26. Didn't save those chief priests and elders in John 12 chapter and verse 42 where the Bible says they believed but they wouldn't confess him because they were being afraid to put out of the synagogue. Those are two examples of believers that were unsaved. But that faith should lead us, if it's true biblical faith, it should lead us to being saved. It should lead us to repenting, like Jesus said in Luke 13. It should lead us to confessing his name. And that's exactly what that eunuch did in the next verse. The Bible says in verse 37 that he made that statement. 
I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When he made that statement, Philip said, Hold your horses. Quite literally. Hold your camels. We're going to baptize him. He commanded the chariot to stand still. We're not going any farther. He confessed Jesus. We're getting in the water. And that's exactly what he, the Bible says. He baptized him. Right there at that spot, at that water, whatever that water was. And he went on his way rejoicing. But it was all conditioned upon the fact that he made that good confession, right? He made that good confession based upon his faith, which led to his baptism. And when you put it all together, what do you got? Remission of sin. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, you got salvation. We can't be saved without, without confessing Christ. And this confession wasn't just a statement that they made, but it demonstrated the fact that they're disciples. The fact that they're followers of Christ. What a glorious name Jesus has. You know, sometimes I think when we think about the confession, we think, well, that's just one of those things that we do before we're baptized. We just stand up here and we say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We think of it maybe in simplistic terms. It's not simple. That statement cost people at Pergamos their life. That statement that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I believe that He is the Lord, that statement caused them to die. Would you die for the name of Christ? Would you die for that statement? We well, ought to. Because He died for you. Philippians 2, 9 and 11. Philippian writer says, Paul, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, Jesus. Now listen how many times he emphasizes the name of Christ in this passage. Speaking of Jesus. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, who? Jesus. And hath given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Every tongue will confess Jesus Christ at some time. It's either you do it today in the salvation or you do it on that day of judgment leading to hell if you've never done it before, but you're going to do it at some point. Every knee's going to bow as well. Why? Because he's Lord. God has exalted him above all. And if you recognize that here and now and get all the blessings and promises that come with that name or the life hereafter and all the condemnation that comes with rejecting that name in this life. Think about how important that name Think about how important names are today. You know, some names carry a lot of weight, don't they? Some names give you access to certain things, don't they? <laughs> You know, if you, uh, let's say you go to a business and you're not satisfied and you know the owner and you mention the owner's name to a worker, well, that's probably going to get your attention. Isn't it? Oh, yeah, what would your uh, boss think about this? Maybe you know the boss. What would they think about this? That's probably going to get some attention, isn't it? If you have a good relationship with whoever that person is, that name means something. To those people, what the name of the governor? That means something, don't it? Whether you like him or not, that name means something. That name can open doors. That name can grant access. I had somebody just a few months ago. They they got a felony a few years ago, and they were trying to get. They were actually trying to get into the education. They went back to school, and they're trying to get an education program at a college. But they had a felony and they couldn't. And they asked me to write, them, write a letter to the governor because he can grant a pardon to allow them to continue down the path of education. Well, that's important. That's an important power to have to be able to say, well, I pardon you, you're no longer a felon. That's pretty important power just by that name. Name of the president. Names are important in this life. And we like to get to know people that are in powerful positions, don't we? Well, what about Jesus Christ? What about His name? 
Think about his name, how insignificant all these human names are in comparison to his name and how all my, just like we sung this morning, lovely name, precious name, what a wonderful name that Jesus Christ has. Paul says, again, it's above all names. And every, every name will bow and every tongue will confess at some point. And these Christians at Pergamos understood that. It means something to them because they were willing to die for it. And some of them did die for it. I don't know who Antipas was. I have no idea who Antipas was. It's the only time his name is mentioned in the Bible in verse 13. But the Bible says that he that they hadn't denied the faith even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr. What's a martyr? A martyr is somebody who dies for their belief. Obviously, Antipas was faced with that great question. Would you die for the name of Christ? And he did. He became a martyr, dying for the cause of Christ. Would we do that today? You know, I heard just the other day about a group of Christians, I believe it was in Egypt. They, they had got a bus, and they were heading out to some... Um, they were going to a monastery, I believe. A monastery somewhere out in, in Egypt. Maybe close to where the eunuch was at. Who knows? But they were heading out that way to this monastery. It was a, a group of men, women, and children. And some radical Islamic terrorists stopped them, made them all get off that bus, and told them all to renounce Christ. They all refused, and they killed every one of them. Now, that happened in the last two weeks. Imagine that. You know, we think we got it tough here in this country sometimes. What did it cost us to confess Christ? Again, sometimes we overlook our confession. Maybe, again, we look at it in simplistic terms. Some people state it and maybe never think about it again. How do I know that? Well, because they never show up here again. Maybe they thought, well, if I do this, I'm saved. That's all i got to worry about. Going through some process, and then that's it. I'm good. Don't ever have to do anything again. Well, that didn't mean anything to those people. We all know people that have been like that. Wanted the blessings of salvation for a moment, but then forgot about it in the days and weeks to come. What does that confession mean to you? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What did it cost us to make that good confession? Again, some of Pergamos, it cost them their life. It wasn't just a simple statement to them because they were facing very terrible times. I hope that we're all, that we would be the same in the face of that terrible persecution. In verse 14, the tone of Jesus' letter changes. And Jesus turned from condemnation to chastisement. He says there, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them which hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now Jesus isn't satisfied with his church. Even though they were facing tremendous persecution, even though they didn't give up the name of Christ, he wasn't satisfied because there were some there that held the false doctrine. Unlike the Ephesian church, which Jesus praised for exposing false teachers, the saints at Pergamos tolerated those who held false doctrine. How do I know they tolerated? Well, because Jesus said you have some there in your presence who were believing and teaching these things that are wrong. They were allowing it to happen. You know, sometimes people ask the question, well, was the whole church lost because of a, of a few? Well, I don't know, but I know the whole church was in danger, I tell you that much, because the leadership allowed these false doctrines to be taught there. And so that put this entire group in danger. That's why we have an obligation individually to go to a place and to worship at a place that teaches the truth, that abides by the truth, that doesn't tolerate false doctrines. There was a, a family that just recently, they've been watching a TV program, let the Bible speak, and they, were, they went to a, a church, and I think it was Church of Christ in Jackson County, but there were some things there going on that were not right at all. 
And about a month ago, they left. And they come down to, the, they're going down to Green Acres now. Matter of fact, Joe Heisel was meeting to baptize their granddaughter about two weeks ago. And they did what was right. They recognized that their congregation, just because it wears the name Church of Christ, doesn't mean it's right. Pergamos they had the name Church, didn't it? But they knew there were false doctrine among that congregation. They left. They went to worship somewhere where things were like they should be. That should be a lesson to every one of us. That we've got, we cannot go to a place that tolerates false doctrine. That's why Jesus wanted this congregation to straighten up. You can't tolerate those things. What does he mention? He mentions the doctrine of Balaam. The teaching of Balaam in verse 14 and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in verse 15. Now we don't really know what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is. He also mentioned that to the Ephesians. But he commended them because they didn't put up with it. But at Pergamos, the Nicolaitans evidently had gained a foothold. <coughs> Jesus said, I hate their doctrine. I hate their teaching. And also he says that they taught the doctrine of Balaam. And he gives us a little bit of an insight about what the doctrine of Balaam is. Eating meat sacrificed to idol, idols and committing fornication. Well, what does that mean? Well, who was Balaam? Well, the doctrine of Balaam has reference to an Old Testament story recorded in Numbers chapter 22 through 25. I hope we all remember that story of Balaam. Balaam was a Gentile prophet of God, which is unusual. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile, but he was a prophet of God. And the king of Moab hired him to curse the children of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. Remember, they were on their way to the, to the uh, promised land. They got diverted because of their lack of faith and they wandered there for many years. And so they were going through the around the king of Moab's territory and uh, he was kind of afraid of them. Didn't want them around. And so he asked Balaam to curse them. Curse these people. He knew Balaam was a prophet. And so Balaam was hesitant but uh, the king of Moab was very influential. He had a name and so he promised Balaam all kinds of riches if he would curse the children of Israel. So Balaam tried his best on four different occasions to curse the children of Israel. But every time he would curse them, a blessing would come out of his mouth. He'd take the money, you know, he would take the money, and then he'd bless them, or he'd try to curse them, but a blessing come out. Why? Well, because these are the Lord's people. And God's not going to allow them to be cursed. If he don't want them to be cursed, it doesn't matter if the prophet's corrupt or not. And so the king of Moab continually got mad. And you remember that story where that Balaam, he, he was on that donkey, and uh, he was riding the donkey. Kind of humorous when you think about it. And uh, the donkey stopped, and he started beating that donkey. And God opened up the donkey's mouth, and the donkey spoke to Balaam because the donkey could see what was in front of him, and it was an angel getting ready to kill him. And the donkey stopped, saving him. It's life and Balaam's life, and he spoke. The donkey spoke to Balaam. Remember that? Well, that's that's all involved in this in this story. So what happened? Well, after the king of Moab realized he couldn't get Balaam to curse the people, he went about it a different way. He enticed the Israelites to commit fornication and idolatry. He sent the Moabite women in amongst the men of Israel, and they were corrupted by sinning against God when they committed fornication and idolatry with these Moabite women. That was a lot more. That was a lot better plan from the king. Why? Because he was striking at the weak hearts of these men instead of trying to get the prophet of God to curse the people. That was much more effective. And that's what the doctrine of Balaam has reference to. It is condemned three times in Scripture here in Revelation 2 and 14 and Jude 11 and in 2 Peter 2 and verse 15. Let's read over there to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. And this is part of Peter's general discourse against false teaching. He says here in 2 Peter 2 and 12, But these... As natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of those things they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. 
and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. He's talking about false teachers. Having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart that exercises with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked by, for his iniquity, the dumb donkey speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried to the tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. What strong language is it? That's strong language for false teachers that would deceive individuals. And those false teachers <coughs> will be condemned. But we also, again, are responsible for our own salvation. And so we've got to make sure that we're not following these kinds of individuals. Well, evidently, there are those of Pergamos that taught doctrines similar to Babel. They were tolerating fornication and idolatry for some monetary gain like Balaam, and certainly they were condemned just like he was. But again, there are also those of Pergamos who held the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And this group is also mentioned in the Ephesian letter, but they were praised because they didn't tolerate it. Now, we don't know who the Nicolaitans were. We don't know what they were teaching exactly, but Jesus said he hated it. It was no doubt a perversion of the true doctrine, and churches were expected to, to rebuke it and to hold the true doctrine. So what's the lesson that we can learn from all this? Well, the rebuke of the church of Pergamos, we must not tolerate false doctrine in any way, shape, or form. These Christians were not rejecting those false teachers, and they were not withdrawing fellowship from those that believed it. And this must be done to protect the doctrinal purity of a congregation. And if a congregation's leadership will not do that, and they allow false doctrine to be taught, then you shouldn't go there. Because that puts you in danger, just like it did individuals in this church. In 2 John 10 and 11, John writes and he says, now remember, John was the apostle of love. He talks about love more than any other apostle. Listen to what he says. 2 John 10 and 11. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, the true doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker in his evil deeds. So if someone teaches things that are false, we've got to try to correct them. But we don't wish them well in that. That's why we can't have association with denominationalism. Because denominationalism itself is contrary to the Word of God. There's only one church. Jesus taught this clearly. There's only one body. Jesus said he promised to build his church. What is his church? His church is his body. Ephesians 1, 20 and 22. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 4 that there is one body. There is one church. And that's the true doctrine. And we've got to hold to that. You know that Ephesians 4 chapter, that's the unity chapter. And he talks about there that there's one Lord, one God, one baptism, one faith. What's that mean? That means one system of belief. God didn't come up with a, a, a plan where that uh, all these different people that teach these different things are all right and we're all going to heaven. That's what most people think. That's what most people believe. But that's not what the Word of God teaches at all. There's one doctrine. And we've got a hold of that one doctrine. And if we don't, we're in danger. And we certainly can't bid God's speak to those that teach things that are wrong. Point out their error, yes. Encourage them to do what's right, yes. But we can't go along with them. John says if we treat a brother in a normal fashion who's teaching false doctrine, we're right there with him. That person must be disciplined to preserve the doctrinal purity of a congregation. Turn with me over to 2 Thessalonians where Paul talks more about this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to begin with verse 6 and read down. This is a lengthy reading. Read down through verse 15. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 
beginning with verse 6. Paul writes and he says there, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's amazing how many times Paul says that. In the name of Jesus, by his authority, we command you. Strong language, isn't it? This is not a mere suggestion of what he's getting ready to say. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. For you yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not, not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have no power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but <coughs> busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now Paul is speaking specifically of those that are disorderly, that are not being what they ought to be. He's speaking of those that would be leaders among them, but also among normal disciples. So what is the solution for those that are walking disorderly, that are not what they ought to be, that are teaching things that they shouldn't teach and doing things they shouldn't do. He says you withdraw yourself from them. You withdraw from them. You encourage them. You admonish them to do what's right. And if they refuse to do that, then you withdraw yourself from them. If we fail to do this as a congregation, if we ignore <coughs> false teaching, sweep it under the rug, false doctrine, immoral living, then this congregation may be condemned as well. Jesus holds it against the entire congregation Pergamus because they tolerated these kinds of things. They allowed those kind of things to go on. If we tolerate sin, we may as well be committing it because as, as, as John said, if we wish them good God's speed, then we are a partaker in their evil deeds. That should be a sobering warning to every one of us. <coughs> Well, finally, in conclusion, Jesus instructs them in verse 16 to repent. And he warns them what will happen if they do not. And this is how Jesus ends every message to the churches of Asia. He says, repent, or else I will come to thee quickly and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. You know what that means? It means if you don't repent, the truth is going to nail you. I'm going to fight against you with the words of my mouth. What's that, what does that mean? Well, that means the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. That's what's going to what come. That's our great standard, isn't it? Remember what Jesus said in John 12 and 48? He said, the word that I have spoken shall judge you in the last day. Those things that he said, that's our great standard. And if we don't hold to that standard, then we're not going to be accepted of him. So he tells this congregation to repent, to turn, to change what you're doing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, again, that's his message, overcoming. I will give him even a hidden man, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth. I don't know what all that means. Jesus is speaking here, I think, figuratively. But he's speaking figuratively of those blessings that come to those that obey the gospel. Blessings that come to those that know his name. Blessings that come to those who belong to him. This morning, have you named the name of Christ? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are these blessings assured to you? Well, if they're not, they can be. It's your choice. As we said, we'll all confess Jesus either in this life or in the life to come. Why not do it now? Why not submit your life unto the precepts of the Word of God, obey 
the gospel and through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ you be saved, be a child of God. And then when he stands before Jesus in judgment, he's going to call you home. Why? Because you know his name. Because he, you belong to him and he knows you. And he'll recognize you on that great and final day. What a day that will be. It's going to be a day of dread for many people. But for those that Jesus knows and that know him, you remember in, in Matthew, the seventh chapter, when those individuals stood before Jesus and they said, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, cast out devils in thy name, and done many wonderful works in thy name? Jesus didn't say, No, you didn't do all those good religious things. He didn't say you didn't do those things. But you know what he did say? He said, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. Certainly those individuals were religious. They thought they knew Jesus, but the problem was he didn't know them. Why? Because they weren't abiding in his word. Jesus said in John 8, verses 30 through 32, if you continue in my word, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. This morning, if you've never, if you're not continuing in His Word, if you've never obeyed the gospel, come forward. Obey the simple plan that we outlined: faith, repentance, confession, be baptized, gain remission of your sin, and having all these blessings. If you're a child of God but you've not been what you should, you know that. Come forward this morning, confessing wrongs, and we'll pray with you for you. As the Bible says in James five sixteen, to confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another. Which may be here. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man of the elders. If you want to do the cause, please come on the same side.